Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jin Yin. Uh, I will be uh, talking to you about um, child maltreatment and how to recognize child maltreatment. As a designated place of safety, um, the Children's Hospital has seen many children and adolescents presenting with features of child abuse and neglect. So the objectives okay, of my talk is to recognize the red flags that are concerning for possible uh, child abuse. I will also reinforce some practical aspects around assessments and documentation for suspecting child maltreatment. And finally, how to raise concerns and report when there is the index of suspicion. Nevertheless, what we do want to prevent are cases like this. A five-year-old boy dying in the children's ICU from multiple abusive injuries and severe neglect. This is an extract from the article that was published by Channel News Asia describing a five-year-old boy who was um, severely abused by his parents. The experience with children um, presenting with abusive injuries typically come from emergency departments. It can be variable how cases are picked up in the ED with some centers seeing up to 15% of children's injuries due to abuse. The challenge is highest in young children and infants who are not yet able to provide verbal accounts, especially if there does not seem to be a reliable witness or account, even when the injury is suspicious of abuse. Often, there is reliance on the accompanying adult's account of the incident, and if the injuries seen are consistent with that provided account. Still, it is important to remember that there is a 50% chance of recurrence and up to 10% chance of death if abuse is missed. Some clinicians may be reluctant to label an injury seen on a child as an NAI. It is vital that we need to be clear that NAI does not equate to child abuse. All causes of childhood injury, as, as causes of, of childhood injury, there is a continuum uh, between the accidental and, and non-accidental. At one end of the spectrum, we have injuries caused by unforeseeable and unpreventable events, such as like a, a lightning strike, and at the other end of the spectrum, we have injuries caused by deliberate actions of others, such as adult hitting a child with a belt. It isn't an accident that the adult raises their hand and uses um, an implement to hit a child. To diagnose NAI, you do not need to have proof of intention to harm, although that narrative will usually come with an account given. In the, in the middle, of course, is a gray zone of injury resulting from the failure of adults to provide adequate supervision. And this can um, be resulting from either callousness or, or poor decision-making or neglect um, and involving failure of adults to provide adequate supervision, provide safe environments or, or discourage um, dangerous activities. Some red flags when asking about an injury where there is no explanation or a vague explanation for a serious injury, as in you don't know how the child was injured, the explanation does not fit with the nature or severity of the injury, as in you don't see how that could have caused this. When the developmental age of a child could not possibly fit with the explanation, for example, if a young infant who has not yet learned to turn over rolls off the bed to account for a severe injury or a fracture. Sometimes if there are differing accounts uh, from different witnesses or inconsistent explanations from the same witness, i.e. the accounts keep changing. And lastly, you need to be suspicious if there is a delay in seeking medical attention after a significant injury.
general observations include um, multiple injuries in different stages of healing, when there are concerning or, 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 or distributions of, of patterns of injuries, when there are unusual or specific injuries. The behavior of the child is also important to observe when there's inappropriate behavior, for example, when the child is withdrawn or even overtly friendly with the health professional. And lastly, even inappropriate interactions between the child and the caregiver, this needs to be observed for. Bruises, of course, are the most common non-accidental injuries. But we do need to remember that most bruises are accidental, but these tend to be over bony prominences as opposed to NAI, which are often seen away from these bony prominences. Example, over the face, the ears, the neck, um, the abdomen, back and buttocks. Be more suspicious if bruises are seen in children below nine months of age. Um, the typical phrase would be bruising before cruising. If bruises come in clusters, and also if there are multiple bruises of similar shape and size, suggesting an implement that has caused the injuries. Some people do ask if the colors of bruises give more information. But remember that bruises change color and fade, and that does depend on many factors. For example, the extent of the initial blunt trauma, the child's healing, and even the underlying skin integrity. So generally, although this may not be a reliable sign, it is still important to document what you do see, the location, the size, the shape and color, and if the account is consistent with the injury scene. And then these injuries are more suspicious, especially bruises and marks resembling the shape of an object, as in loop marks, a belt or a clothes hanger, Circumferential bruises on the neck, uh, wrist or ankles suggesting ligature marks, or even cigarette burns or contact burns in the shape of an object. Of course, with the picture on the right, that this is very obvious that this is a non-accidental injury. So next, uh, we will talk about scalds. And when scalds are suspicious, there are often these sharp demarcations that suggests a forced immersion in hot water. For example, you can see from these images, um, the sharp demarcations or tidal lines um, in the extremities of the child's limbs. And of course, in terms of the buttocks, okay, you can see that there are sparing of the buttocks where the child may be firmly pressed against the floor of a tub. On the other hand, scans can def scalds can definitely be accidental, but often there are splash marks and flow lines indicating the direction of the spill. In cases, especially when young children are involved, you will need to decide if there are features of neglect from inadequate supervision. Some statistics around suspicious fractures in children there are features that are more classical. Be more vigilant if there are features in infants and non-ambulant children. Of all the types of physical abuse, abusive head trauma has the highest risk of death and neurological disability. The diagnosis is often unclear and the initial presentation as other medical conditions can have similar features. As I said, the insidious nature of the presentation with seizures, a collapsed child, a child who's just irritable or not feeding well, can be just sleepy or lethargic. However, further investigations and observations of this classical triad of a subdural hemorrhage, cerebral edema, and retinal hemorrhages would drive a high index of suspicion. Differential diagnosis of child physical abuse and features of this are taught extensively in medical school and pediatric training. And still, medical mimics are still important to be excluded. But we do want to emphasize, and I quote one of our emergency pediatricians, 
what is worse than a diagnosis of child abuse? A misdiagnosis of child abuse. I move on next to other types of child abuse. Understanding that not all sexual abuse involves physical contact, the circumstances can include exploitation of a child with, for sexual gratification, often involving a, an adult or a person um, in authority over the child. There is also grooming and, and blackmail. Um, and these are just a list of reportable offenses to be aware of. As we may be more familiar with clear cases of sexual offences from aggravated outraging of modesty or molestation to sexual assault and rape, we need to understand the legal requirements to report. When one is aware of such an offence or intention of any person to commit such an offence, uh, those of you who have worked in the Women's and Children's Hospital will know about the pink form or the MP306A, which is a medical form issued by the police requesting for forensic examination. Victims who are under 18 years of age will be referred either to either Children's Emergency in uh, KK or NUHS and the relevant workflows will take place. Just to highlight an Italian awareness campaign, as you can see, pictures can be the most powerful way to message. We cannot finish the segment without discussing briefly around emotional abuse. There are statistics that we don't have locally, and as a society, we may not have clear alignment or understanding. What international literature and some local anecdotal experience does tell us though, is that emotional abuse or psychological abuse is a common underlying core element that accompanies other types of abuse. We probably need a whole other talk to discuss aspects of this type of abuse. But as professionals caring for infants, children and young people, we should be aware of some signs of possible emotional abuse. Babies and young children may be overly affectionate to strangers or familiar or seem wary, anxious or overly cautious with new strangers, for example, with teachers or, or healthcare professionals. Other behaviours could include being aggressive or cruel to it, towards other children or animals. In older children, there could be signs of inappropriate behaviour emotional dysregulation or outbursts, being socially inadequate or socially isolated, or could be even bullies and, and aggressive or violent. Another poster, this time from the US. Finally, some practical aspects for moving things forward. Documentation is vital, often because there can be medical legal implications. Do write in the clinical notes who accompanied the child and the reason they were brought in. Document the account of the incident that was provided and who provided all the versions. Diagrams are useful to document the injuries as well as the description of the injuries. In a verbal child, also additionally indicating which account attributes to the particular injury. When the account is provided, the statement made by the child or accompanying adult should be recorded verbatim. For example, a young child describing a possible abuse by his mother's boyfriend. Instead of documenting the child reported that Uncle K used his hand to touch his private parts or genitals, use what the child's words may have been. For example, the child reported that Uncle K used his hands to touch his bird bird. And you can document further that the child's grandmother says that the child uses the word bird bird to indicate his genitals or penis. Accuracy is important, especially for suspected non-accidental injuries, as I have stated before. 
And other useful information should include other physical findings such as growth parameters and the demeanor and the behavior of the child and even the clothing and hygiene and how camped the child may be. There is guidance for decision making and reporting. This is the triple SG, which is a screening tool that uses the structured decision making system, which is jointly formulated by MSF with NCCD, which is the National Council on Crime and Delinquency from the US and sector partners. This one is for healthcare professionals. I believe there are specific guides for other frontline professionals example, teachers or school counselors or community social workers. It provides a traffic light key to help decisions of when to refer a child or raise concerns to an expert or a professional within your department. These are called the CARG experts or the Child Abuse Reporting Guide or CARG. And in all organizations, there are these trained professionals who will utilize the more specific guide or the CARG for reporting. In the hospital setting, the internal CARG experts is usually the medical social worker. From the community setting, all departments should observe their protocol for raising concerns of, for child abuse and neglect. If there are further evaluations that are needed of injuries, or if an interim place of safety is needed, you can refer either to KKH or NUH Children's Emergency. Of course, explain to caregivers that there are concerns about the injuries or findings. You should remain non-judgmental and still express that your priority is for an evaluation of the child's safety and well-being. Under the Child and Young Persons Act or the CYPA, Reporting is mandatory, but often that gets referred until the child is at the children's hospital. For completeness, the helpline is available for information as well as reporting, especially in the event that the caregiver that you have addressed this with may have absconded with the child. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of documentation, even around your recommendations and your plans and your protocols that you have put in place. So with this, I end my talk. I thank you for protecting the children in Singapore and for advocating for the vulnerable. I finally give uh, thanks and acknowledgement to my KKH SCAN team for sharing their references and presentation slides. Thank you very much.